Okay, so I have 1201, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure more people are going to join, um, but I want to make sure that we make really good use of this hour. Um, I'm going to talk for a while, um, but the chat is open. I love to hear questions, um, and I will definitely leave time for some um, Q&A at the end. Um, I do have my chat up as well, so if there's something that strikes you in the um, during the course of the presentation, go ahead and throw that in the chat as well. Okay, so I muted for a second. That was my cuckoo clock telling me it is time to go. Okay. So I want to start um, off by just making sure that everyone on the call knows about Kentucky and Works, um, who we are, what we do. Officially, Kentucky and Works is the Workforce Development Board for the Louisville region. This includes Bullitt, Henry, Jefferson, Oldham, Shelby, Spencer, and Trimble counties. Um, we are funded primarily through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act which is a federal piece of legislation um, often referred to as WIOA that funds uh, the workforce system across the country. Um, but at Kentucky and it Works, we also receive substantial funding from Louisville Metro government, the Department of Education, HUD, foundations, and grants. And so what does it mean to be a workforce board? We operate um, a regional network of career center services that includes things like career counseling, resume building, job training and education, and direct referrals to employers. So these are the types of services that we use for our job seeking customers. Um, and we serve them at the Kentucky Career Centers, at the SPOT Young Adult Opportunity Campus, through um, programs like Summer Works and Kentucky and Builds and Code Louisville. Um, and then we also serve employers. So we connect employers with skilled, qualified workers by offering um, job fairs and connecting them with uh, program participants who are coming out of education and training. And labor market intelligence is an important function um, of Kentucky and Works. So, uh, for those of you who might not know me, my name is Sarah Ayersman. I'm the Director of Labor Market Intelligence. And in my role, I really try to focus on creating accessible and data-focused resources. I want people, um, all of the various stakeholders throughout the workforce system to understand what's going on in the local labor market and the economy and to use data to help them make good, smart, informed choices. So whether that's job seekers and students thinking about their career paths, um, employers trying to figure out where they can get workers, policymakers trying to make changes that will impact the, the local labor market or the economy. Um, I wanna you know, use all of the available data that we have from, from federal agencies to make sure that um, those are all informed through that labor market lens. Um, so, a big shout out to our website, kentuckianaworks.org slash LMI. Um, that is the labor market intelligence page at our website. There you can find key LMI resources, um, the latest research, and then um, I put out a monthly newsletter where you can sign up um, for that as well. Okay. So I wanna make sure that we just do a quick overview of the, a broad overview of the global economy before we really dive in to the meat and potatoes of this presentation, which is focused on um, you know, the two years of the pandemic. So first I wanna make sure that I'm defining the global region. Um, so I'm gonna be referring to the Louisville Metropolitan Statistical Area or MSA. Um, this is a 10 county footprint with uh, six counties in Kentucky and four in Southern Indiana. This MSA is defined by the Federal Office of Management and Budget, and it's based on the population that lives in an urban area um, and their commuting patterns. And so in, the, in um, the Louisville MSA, we have employment centers in Jefferson County, of course, Bullitt, Clark, and Floyd counties. And then these other regional counties are part of the MSA because a significant uh, proportion of their population are commuting into these counties for work. And so throughout the presentation, um, in general, the geographic uh, area I'll be covering is this um, Louisville MSA. Within the MSA, um, six industries account for nearly two thirds of the local private sector jobs. Um, and so if you see me, um, hear me focusing on particular, particular industries more so than others, it's because um, they have relative importance um, to our local economy. 
So um, the, the six industries are healthcare, manufacturing, retail, um, logistics, um, food and hotels, um, and then finance and insurance. Um, and then I also want to mention there are 10 types of jobs that account for a full quarter of the region's employment. And so we can see um, those entry level positions in logistics, manufacturing, retail, um, makeup are the three largest occupations in our region, um, you know, sort of aligning with the, the importance of those industry sectors we saw on the previous slide. Okay, so now that we sort of um, understand where we're talking about and sort of the broad overview of um, the economy, I want to get to um, what's been going on in our region um, in the labor market during the COVID-19 pandemic. So first I wanna show you just payroll employment. So this is just the number of jobs on payrolls in the global region. So in March and April of 2020, you know, payrolls um, basically shut down. The economy, the local economy lost more than 100,000 jobs, 104,000 jobs in just those two months. Um, in the two years since, we have brought back uh, 98,500 of those jobs. So we've recovered 95% of the jobs lost um, during the COVID-19 recession, which was officially just those two months. Um, and so the pace of this recovery is quite remarkable. Um, even though, you know, we lost a lot more jobs during the COVID-19 recession, we're recovering them at a much faster rate as compared to the previous two recessions in the region. So this light blue line is showing you the Great Recession in um, 2008, 2009, and then this light purple is the 2001 recession. And so by comparison, you know, we can see during those recessions, the job loss was a lot slower and the recovery was a lot slower. So it took us, you know, this many months to get back to our um, employment levels from uh, before the recession. Here during the COVID-19 recession, we have not fully recovered. You know, we're still um, have like 5% to go, but the pace of this recovery has been so much faster compared to other recessions. Um, and we really have, you know, fiscal and monetary policy to thank for, for that very fast recovery. Um, but I want to dig in a little bit because, you know, when you look at those top level aggregate numbers, sometimes you miss how the recovery has been unequal or uneven for, for different sectors and for different people. Um, so this looks at the employment recovery by sector, just the latest 12 months of data um, compared to its pre-COVID levels. And so we can see that the logistics sector, transportation, warehousing, and utilities, employment has more than rebounded. Employment levels are, are not only at their pre-COVID levels, they're higher than their pre-COVID levels. Um, we also see some of our you know, professional services and financial activities um, sectors have also fully rebounded, more than rebounded. Um, so these are sectors where you know, the employment loss was smaller to begin with. A lot of these jobs transitioned into work from home relatively easily. Um, and so those employment levels are, are fully, fully back to where they were um, before the pandemic. Um, down on the other hand, though, we have leisure and hospitality down here. Um, you know, this sector saw the largest employment losses um, and employment levels are still down 12% in that sector. Uh, manufacturing is still down 4%, um, and construction down 1%, retail down 2%. So um, similarly, we're seeing some differences in the way um, that jobs are coming back in terms of their wage levels. And so even though you know no, none of the jobs are fully rebounded by um, wage category, the lowest paying jobs in the region, those that pay less than $14 per hour, are still down more than 26% um, in the region compared to their pre-pandemic levels, whereas middle wage and higher wage jobs um, have recovered much faster. Um, but so we know that job that, that employers are, are really looking for workers right now, um, and that's reflected in the data as well. We can see um, online job postings have reached just record highs um, in March and April. You know there were twenty two more than twenty two thousand uh, job postings each month, new job postings, 
um, and sort of the rate of months that we've seen more than 20,000 job postings per month um, has just reached a new record in 2021 and 2022. Um, and again, I wanna take a moment to just really compare uh, that to what happened after the Great Recession, where we saw, you know, sort of a jobless recovery is what it was referred to, where online job postings um, were not at all at the record that we are seeing uh, them now. Um, and so the source for this data is from MZ Burning Glass, um, which, you know, scrapes the web um, from a lot of different, you know, data sources, um, Indeed and Monster and all those, but then also individual um, employer posting um, employer websites, and then deduplicates them. So part of the frustration from employers has sort of um, has sort of come led to, to a story about the great resignation. So we've seen many headlines about how uh, people are quitting their jobs at high rates. Kentucky in particular has made many a headline for having the highest quits rate in the country or the highest increase in the quits rate in the country. Um, and that is true. That definitely plays out in the data. Um, but I want to point out a couple of things about this data. One, um, I want you to notice the extreme volatility that we're seeing. Um, so this is a new product from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And while um, I value it, what it has to provide for us, I think that putting too much emphasis on just a single month when there's this much volatility can be misleading at times. Um, but at any rate, we are seeing you know, record high quits rates. Uh, much higher than, you know, basically since this data has been reported. So part of the narrative seems to suggest that people are quitting their jobs, and this is why, you know, employers can't find workers because they're quitting their jobs and they're not working. If that were true, then what we would expect to see in the data is the size of our labor force declining at the same time, right? People are quitting their jobs, they've stopped working, they're not looking for work, they're not in the labor force. Um, but that's not what we see in the data. Um, so very early on in the pandemic, we did see a, um, a decline in the size of our labor force. But really, since the summer of 2020, overall, the labor force has been on a positive trajectory. So, you know, this is non-seasonally adjusted data. So we're gonna be seeing peaks and valleys. More people tend to come into the labor force during the summer, young people in particular. Um, but in general, you know, we're seeing this nice positive trajectory since the summer of 2020. Um, and in March, um, the size of the labor force actually reached its pre-pandemic level. So we're back at that 680,000 people, um, which compared to March of 2019, you know, is about 17,000 people more. Um, and so the labor force is capturing people who are either employed, so they have a job, or they don't have a job, but they are actively looking for one. So they looked for work in the last month. Um, and so we're not counting people in the labor force who, you know, are retired, who have no interest in sort of looking for a job. They're not counted in the labor force. Um, or, you know, those that are in school who have no interest in sort of looking for work. So it's, um, it's only counting those who have actively looked for a job in the last month. Um, and so the size of the labor force, you know, hasn't fallen off a cliff the way that the quits rates, you know, might suggest if people were just quitting their job and stopped looking for work. Um, and in fact, what we see when we plot the quits rate with the hiring rate, we can see at the same time that the rate of people being hired has also reached record highs. Um, and so I think this great resignation might be more appropriately framed as uh, a great reshuffle, right, where people are quitting their job and then taking employment elsewhere. Um, that's what the size of the labor force is signaling, along with um, the rate of people hiring. And so the quits rate is capturing the percentage of people who quit their job, um, who voluntarily left their job, um, over the divided by the total number of people um, employed. Um, and so it is not counting people who left their job to retire. It's people who volunteer, and it's not counting people who, um, you know, were laid off through no fault of their own. They had to voluntarily quit. Um, and, it, and then people who retire are sort of counted in a separate category. They're not counted as quit quitters. Um, and so we are seeing lots of people voluntarily leaving their jobs. 
Um, and I think the data suggests that they are then taking employment um, somewhere else in the local economy. And this is having a big influence on wages. And so this is showing average wages across all workers in the global region. Um, this is, we I had to use all private sector workers because to get the monthly data, um, this is what's available. So I just wanna talk at this high level for just a, a minute, but you know, average wages in 2021 overall were about 10% higher than they were in 2019. And really in like the five years preceding the pandemic, we didn't really see average wage growth hardly at all. So I have plotted here just $23 per hour. And you can see like from 2015 onward, um, average hourly wages just kind of just kind of basically stayed at the 23 hour, um, 23, $23 per hour range. Um, just before the pandemic, when the labor market was also getting quite tight, we started to see um, some increase in wages, but nothing quite like we have seen since um, the COVID-19 recession. So in April, um, the average hourly wage was just over $28 per hour. Um, this is, you know, almost two, more than $2 more than it was at the same time in 2021. Um, and basically four and a half dollars more than it was at the same time in 2019. So we've seen significant wage growth. And part of what that is, is that great reshuffle. People are quitting their jobs, taking employment elsewhere. And when they do, they're leaving for a job with a higher wage. And so employers that are offering those higher wages um, are sort of winning the battle for workers right now. Um, we're also seeing that um, wage growth by industry is faster in some in some industries, particularly those industries with high turnover rates and with lots of low wage workers. So retail and leisure and hospitality have seen the fastest wage growth in our region. Um, this is showing third quarter wages in 2021 over third quarter wages of 2019. Um, and so those industries that are really competitive competing for those lower wage workers are seeing the fastest wage growth. Okay, so I want to shift to the unemployment rate. Um, the unemployment rate peaked at a very record high in April of 2020 at almost 17%. This was the highest that has ever been recorded for our region. This shows all of the data that has ever been recorded for the unemployment rate in the global region. Um, but since it peaked in April 2020, it fell precipitously as well. Um, you know, so again, we're seeing that really fast recovery um, playing out locally as well. In March, the unemployment rate was 4.2%. And so Again, this is non-seasonally adjusted data, so we're going to see peaks and valleys, but we're also seeing, you know, quite a bit of volatility um, in the unemployment rate um, it, during the recovery. And so I want to pause for a moment and talk about that. So there are two reasons that the unemployment rate could go up. One is that an employed, an employed person becomes unemployed. Uh, and then the other reason would be that someone who was not in the labor force, so they were not looking for a job, has started looking for a job. So now they are brought back into the labor force, they're brought back into the calculation of the unemployment rate. So previously, if they were not in the labor force and they were not looking for a job, they would not be counted in this rate. But now when they start looking for a job, they're counted as unemployed. And so these re-entrants into the labor market can also drive up the unemployment rate. This is actually a good thing, though. We want people to come back to the labor force and we want them to look for a job. So um, what we're seeing driving a lot of this volatility primarily is not people going from employed to unemployed, but it's re-entrants into the labor market, you know, who are taking a little bit of time to, to transition from being um, you know, in the labor market and then finding and securing a job. Um, but on a month to month basis, this is driving some fluctuation um, in, the, in the unemployment rate. So I also want to break down the unemployment rate a little bit. Um, this is national level data. It's not available at the local level, but there's really no reason to think that it's not playing out locally as well. 
Um, the unemployment rate for black workers is historically been higher than the unemployment rate for white workers, and that continues in um, the recovery from the COVID-19 recession. So unemployment rate for black workers peaked at a much higher rate than it did for white workers. And while, you know, the unemployment rate has fallen for, for both, um, it has fallen faster for white workers. And so there's still a three percentage point gap in the unemployment rate for black workers and white workers nationally. And so again, when we look at those top level numbers and the aggregate, it's really important to get a good picture of what's going on with that top level number. But sometimes it's also um, equally important to kind of peel that back and look at how the recovery is going differently for different sectors and for different workers. Okay, so I wanna to return to the size of the labor force. Um, the size of the labor force gets a lot of attention. It's a really important metric because it gauges, again, you know, who in our local region is working or if they're not working, actively looking for a job. And so this is the potential pool of you know, people that we have to engage in the workforce to get them connected with employers um, and sort of fill all those online job postings, right? So. While we have reached our pre-pandemic level, we are still below trend. So before the pandemic, you know, the labor force was growing nicely. Um, and if we sort of extrapolate that out, then we might expect that the labor force would be closer, you know, to more than 700,000 people if the pandemic had never happened. And this gap is a contributing factor to the labor shortage that we are feeling um, both locally and nationally. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what has happened to people um, and why the size of the labor force might be below trend um, as compared to before the pandemic. So first up, um, lots of older workers retired. So up until, you know, just a few months ago, the, throughout the majority of the recovery, the stock market has done really well. The housing market has done really well. Um, older workers were, of course, at higher risk of complications from COVID-19. Um, and so a lot of older workers just simply retired. Um, so I wanted to share this research from the St. Louis Fed, and it shows um, the rate of retirements nationally. So after the Great Recession, um, the baby boomer generation was old enough to start retiring. And at that point, we saw the rate of retirements start to increase um, significantly over the trend that we had seen before the baby boomers were old enough to retire. So the trend line for the baby boomers retiring is shown here in red. And then what actually happened is shown here in blue. And so this gap, this, these excess retirements, um, these authors found accounted for more than half of the people who left the labor force since before the pandemic. Um, so the thing about retirements is they tend to be sticky. That is, if you retire, you know, you're less likely to come back into the labor force later. However, it's definitely not impossible. And we have seen um, coverage of unretirements popping up lately um, for employers who are sort of thinking about how to engage with older workers there are lots of different strategies around you know providing more flexible schedules and part-time work um, still maintaining you know their benefits um, helping having them train you know younger workers so that they're sort of an end in sight um, you know are all kind of strategies to think about how to re-engage with older workers um, or prevent them from retiring early in the first place. Um, I also wanna talk about the role of immigrants. Um, during the Trump administration and certainly during the pandemic, um, immigration all but halted um, and immigrants are an important component of our labor force. So within our region, the immigrant population, more than 60% of the immigrant population are in their prime working years, 25, um, to 54. And they're overrepresented in sectors who are pretty desperate for workers at this point, um, construction, manufacturing, and leisure and hospitality. Um, and so you know, policy changes aimed at increasing immigration and you know, being that welcoming community that the rural region is for um, immigrants and refugees will also help um, shore up our labor supply problem. 
childcare is um, also has gotten a lot of attention during the pand pandemic, rightfully so. Um, you know, when schools were virtual, mothers, especially of young kids, um, really had to kind of step back from the labor force in a big way. Um, you know, schools are back in session, which is great, um, so that a lot of mothers have come back into the labor force. Um, but parents of young children are still facing big childcare issues. Um, and then when I, um, I'm talking about childcare, I'm also thinking um, before and after school care, um, you know, because the school day obviously does not perfectly coincide with the work day. Um, so what we're seeing in child daycare services in our region is that employment levels are still down about 15%. Um, so daycare services are very labor intensive. And so this decline in employment has really limited the availability of childcare slots. Um, for very good reason, you know, daycare services are regulated so that there are a certain number of children, um, you know, a certain number of childcare slots per worker. So you can't like have so many kids under the supervision of too few adults. Um, and so having these employment levels um, be down 15% has limited the availability of, of childcare slots in our region. Um, at the same time, for the slots that are left, um, they're becoming more expensive. Um, just like you know, other sectors, the daycare service sector is, is trying to increase wages um, for their workers to you know, compete with the wage increases that we're seeing in other sectors. Um, but because it is such a labor intensive industry sector, um, those wage increases are, are pretty immediately passed on to parents. And so for the child care slots that are available, they are more expensive. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, even if you are able to get a child care slot um, that you can afford, um, many parents have to face quarantine and closure potential for their kids. I mean, it's important to remember children under five are still not eligible for a vaccine. Um, and so, so child day daycare services have to um, quarantine and, and potentially close classrooms when there's um, a COVID-19 exposure. And so for parents, you know, working particularly in in-person low wage jobs, it can be very difficult to balance these childcare options and, and to be able to show up for work. Um, you know, if, if you have that in-person job and then your kid's daycare closes, you know, you have to stay home with them. You have to take unpaid leave um, typically. And, and the cost equation gets very challenging, you know, and then a lot of employers obviously don't want their workers to miss work that much. Um, and so the childcare crisis, you know, ch childcare was a problem before the pandemic. It has become a crisis during the pandemic and it has really limited the ability of parents um, and mothers in particular for participating in the labor force. Um, the data also shows us, you know, what the primary reasons for people not in the labor force, why, you know, why are they not in the labor force? We can look at that data. So this is for Kentucky um, and it shows the primary reasons for not participating in the labor force for our prime working age adults, um, 25 to 54. Um, and the number one and number two reason have been having a disability or illness or taking care of house or family. Um, last year, taking care of house or family became the number one reason, disability or illness became the number two reason. Um, but so, you know, we've talked about childcare already, so I want to spend just a moment talking about disability or illness. Um, Kentucky has a very high rate of, uh, of the population with a disability. And again, employers who are willing to think creatively and strategically about how to engage with workers um, who are who might be on the sidelines here, um, targeting you know, people with a disability is, is one potential um, labor supply because it's keeping a lot of people out of the labor force. Um, you know, before the pandemic, I talked a lot about barriers to work. Um, those barriers to work are still present. Some of them have been made worse by the pandemic, such as childcare. Um, but again, you know, having having a disability is, is a barrier to work. Transportation is a barrier to work. So this is showing just where our employment centers are um, in, in Jefferson County and in Southern Indiana. And you, know, you can see they're not exactly um, 
very centralized, right? They're really spread out. Um, and so getting to work, if you don't have an automobile can be quite challenging. Um, you know, public transportation can be an option, but, um, you know, bus routes can be limited. Um, they might not, you know, align with certain shifts. Um, they can also be very time consuming. Um, and it can be a, a real challenge to rely on public transportation when these employment centers are so spread out. Um, you know, and then put the pandemic on top of that. And, you know, the, the resource of public transportation has been limited um, as well during the pandemic. We also know that, um, you know, facing, uh, trying to come into the workforce with a record of court involvement um, can be challenging and incarceration rates disproportionately affect black and men um, in our region, black workers and men. Um, and so, you know, again, employers who are creative and strategic about engaging with and working with um, individuals who have a record of court involvement, again, opens up a, a whole new um, labor, potential labor supply. But we, um, you know, I want to acknowledge that the size of the labor force is smaller than it was, you know, on trend um, prior to the pandemic. And employers are also looking to technology to fill in the gap. So automation um, and the use of um, advanced technologies was underway before the pandemic. And this is a trend that has almost certainly accelerated during the pandemic. Um, although we don't have hard data on that. Um, the number of Kentucky firms um, using, you know, touch screens and kiosks for customer interface, this was the number one, the highest use of advanced technologies, you know, and like, as an example, we're seeing, you know, at your local grocery store, more self-checkout self lanes and fewer cashiers. And so we're seeing the use of technology um, sort of make up for some of that labor, sh labor shortage as well. Uh, because, you know, the demand for goods and services is not slowing. <laughs> so um, here on the left, we're seeing consumer spending on goods. Um, so durable goods, you know, stuff like um, appliances, electronics, motor vehicles, and non-durable goods like uh, food for the home and clothing. Um, you know, spending on goods just really surged during the pandemic. It took a dip, you know, during the very height of the pandemic, but since then, it's been well beyond its pre-COVID trend, um, basically since the summer of 2020. So many, uh, many people did not lose their job during the pandemic. Um, they were, you know, they got a lot of um, stimulus money as well. So there was money to spend. Um, and people were spending more times in their more time at their homes, and they wanted to make their homes nicer. So they, you know, were really doubling down on spending goods, um, spending money on goods, um, especially when they couldn't really spend money on services, right? It was, it was less safe, more difficult to spend money on on services. And so we saw this huge shift in consumer spending towards goods. Um, so that, you know, coupled with supply chain bottlenecks has really created um, it, sort of an imbalance in, in what we were used to seeing um, consumer spending on, on goods. Here on the right, we're looking at it, uh, consumer spending on services. Um, and so it's almost back on trend, you know, it's back up to where it was before the pandemic. Um, and even though the shift to spending on services has been slower than the shift um, than spending on, on goods, it's almost back to where it was um, so we're seeing, you know, huge demand on the demand side, huge demand for goods and services throughout the, the local um, and national economy, which is uh, becoming a, a big driver of inflation. Um, and so inflation's been in the news quite a bit. Um, it's, you know, we're seeing the highest inflation rate that we've seen in over 40 years. Um, you know, many people have not really experienced inflation the way that we're experiencing it now. Um, and Early on in the pandemic, um, price increases were really being driven by by the goods sector because of that you know shift in, in consumer spending that we saw on the previous slide, and so the the inflation for durable goods um, was really the main driver of inflation initially, um, and so you know if you weren't buying a car or 
uh, appliances or electronics, you might not have noticed inflation in the way that we're all noticing it now, because inflation has now shifted into the service sector as well. Um, and so inflation for goods is still high, um, and now it's increasing in the service sector as well. So it's really sort of permeating throughout the economy in a big way. Um, and it's really coming down to um, the cost of basic needs have been increasing um, a lot in, in, since 2021. Um, and so here I'm just looking at food, rent, and household energy. So just the basic things that you need you know, to put a roof over your head and food on the table. And um, all of the costs of those things are increasing as well. And so I wanna to return to that slide I showed you on how average wages were increasing and they are, and that's great. But if the cost of goods and your basic needs um, are going up at the same time, then your purchasing power hasn't really changed. Even though you're making more money, everything is more expensive. And um, for low wage workers in particular who spend a higher percentage of their um, income on those basic needs, um, they're not necessarily better off than they were before. And in fact, if we look at um, wage growth um, for our region, after we had, um, you know, if we just look at pure wage growth, just on the, you know, without adjusting for inflation, we can see that it, it looks quite high, wages are going up. Um, but after we adjust for inflation here in the blue line, we can see um, that wage growth is modest to zero at, you know, at best. Um, and so again, even though employers might feel like you know, they're paying more, um, workers are not going to necessarily feel that they're better off um, because of inflation. Um, so I want to sort of conclude here um, talking about wages a little bit more um, and share with you the living wage model for the Louisville region. So this is an estimation of what a household in our region would need to maintain just basic economic self-sufficiency without using any public assistance programs and without facing housing or food insecurity. Um, and so that wage threshold for one adult with no children is almost $16 per hour. Um, and so I just, you know, when we think about wage thresholds that are appropriate for um, workers in our region, um, you know, this is the living wage for one adult, no children, um, $22, more than $22 per hour, um, almost 23 is the wage threshold for two working adults um, with two children. So each adult would need to earn almost $23 per hour to, um, you know, have that family sustaining wage. Um, and so when I bring, I wanted to bring back up the chart that kind of the table here that shows um, our 10 largest occupations. So one in four workers is employed in one of these occupations um, and half of them have a median wage less than $15 an hour, which is less than that living wage for a single adult with no children. Um, and so just take one on the top, this um, hand labor, material mover position, which is sort of the entry level position in the logistics sector, um, the median hourly wage, less than $15 per hour. And so, you know, logistics employers who are paying more than this are going to be attracting workers away um, from those that are paying less than this um, because workers know how much they need to get by. And um, with the cost of basic needs going up, um, they're going to be looking for employers who are willing to pay them more. Same table, just also showing that um, eight out of 10 of these occupations pay less than that family supporting wage. Um, so one in four workers in one of these jobs, and if they have you know, two people working with two kids, um, they still might not be able to make ends meet. Um, and so, you know, especially with inflation on the rise, workers are definitely paying attention to wages. Okay, so my final takeaways, um, the tight labor market definitely gives workers more choices. Um, there are so many available jobs right now that workers are able to consider, you know, if they're happy with their current employer. Um, and if not, you know, maybe quit and take it another position elsewhere. Um, you know, employers are attracting workers when they offer higher wages, but also um, non-wage benefits like paid time off, um, insurance, 
a stable schedule, you know, flexible schedule to be able to stay home with the kids if they need to. Um, visible career pathways um, are also very important to workers to see that they have career advancement opportunities with an employer um, and worker voice, you know, feeling heard and understood um, by their employer. Workplace culture matters. Um, you know, we've had in the midst of the pandemic, we've also had a reckoning um, of racial tension once again, um, both in our community and also nationally. And so making sure that workers um, feel valued and, and understood um, within their place of employment um, is also critical to, to attracting and maintaining workers. Um, Pre-COVID barriers to work were, um, you know, are still a problem. They were a problem before, they're still a problem now, and some of them have just gotten worse during the pandemic. Um, so again, I'm thinking childcare, lack of transportation, um, you know, trying to find work with a record of court involvement, um, and, and then having a disability. And so at workers, um, or excuse me, employers who are sort of strategic and helping workers navigate those barriers are also gonna be able to attract um, labor, uh, more labor to their place of employment. So finally, you know, employers willing to invest in workers and help them navigate those barriers are just gonna have better luck filling those open positions. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. If there are any, I'm gonna open up the chat again. Um, and then I also just wanna mention, you know, this is our first time doing kind of webinar like this. Um, and so I'm gonna be sending out the slides and a recording of this presentation. I'm also gonna send you a short survey because we are interested in knowing if you like this um, format and if you would like us to do it again. Um, and then some topics that you might be interested um, in hearing about. Um, this is, you know, this is just us experimenting with um, communicating about what's going on in the labor market in a different way um, than we have before. So, okay, I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but I will give it a few minutes. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch, um, and I hope that this was a fun way uh, to, to um, you know, enjoy lunch while, while learning something. Um, thank you for those who are putting um, kind comments in the chat. Still no questions yet. Um, So I have a question here. Did I notice trends and movements between sectors? Um, and I think absolutely yes is the answer to that question. Um, I think that in particular, what we saw early on was um, a shift of workers from the leisure and hospitality sector, which saw really the steepest employment losses um, and moving into the logistics sector, um, which were hiring throughout the pandemic. Um, and so both of those sectors have a relatively low barrier to entry. Um, and I think that we did see a, a big shift and that's why we, in part, why we've seen the logistics sector um, fully rebound and the leisure and hospitality sector not uh, fully rebound. Um, anecdotally, I think it's interesting too, because, um, you know, the logistics sector uh, can provide more stable scheduling, um, you know, that not having to, to work, um, you know, uh, with customers on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, and, and so, it, you know, I kind of thought that people would shift back um, after, you know, once the sort of thing settled, but um, I think it's really difficult to be a worker in the leisure and hospitality sector right now in a way that maybe they stayed. Um, and so workers, again, are having that option to find the kind of uh, position that where they feel, you know, they're being compensated correctly, um, where they feel valued. Um, and so, yes, we're definitely seeing that those transitions across sectors as well. Okay, any other questions? Well, um, when the slide deck goes out, you will have my contact information. So I'm always um, happy to field questions, um, you know, if something comes up af afterwards. But otherwise, you know, um, I'm going to give you the 15 minutes back. And um, thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. Um, and please fill out the survey when I send it out. <laughs>